ferocity of the fight. Uh, this is a lecture for my fifth hour class on the 19th of April. Uh, they're completely unprepared for weapons of mass destruction that have been introduced by the uh, Industrial Revolution, the machine gun being one of them, but another is gas. Write this down. There were two types of gas. This is the first war. And by the way, the last war in which gas was legal. Gas is so devastating that uh, it's outlawed. Uh, and, and very few people have tried to use it since then. But there were two types. There was mustard and chlorine. Mustard gas that just you choked to death. Chlorine gas, you know, you're young and healthy and your lungs are probably in as good a shape as they'll ever be in. But you could take one small whiff of chlorine gas and uh, it would be as if somebody, your lungs would look as, look as if somebody had taken them and put them on a bar barbecue grill for 45 minutes. Uh, gas also caused blindness. And so that's why at the end of World War I, in any, in any of the nations that fought in the First World War, uh, you have young men, 18, 19, 20 years old, begging on street corners with white canes because they had lost uh, their sight. Uh, the first uh, in, the, in the war, the first instance of gas being used in warfare, again, I'm not going to talk a lot about these World War I battles, but eat press, okay, write that down. That's a World War I battle in Belgium. And what happened was there were a group of Canadians, you know, Canada was, had been part of the British Empire. It was now part of the British Commonwealth. And uh, they, um, there were a group of Canadians holding a section of the line and uh, the way they would uh, use this gas is they'd put it in canisters about this big and about that thick, and they'd fire it out of a can and it hit the ground and it would bounce just like a pebble, skipping across the pond, and all of a sudden it would start hissing out this uh, grayish green, uh, looked like smoke, it was gas. Uh, and these Canadians are there waiting for this German attack and they see these canisters hitting the ground and all of a sudden you have this grayish green gas and it starts to, uh, uh, engulf their men up there, you know, their advanced troops, and they notice that those guys are falling down, holding their throats, or choking to death. Well, one of the Canadian officers had paid attention in chemistry class because he knew exactly what it was, and he took his handkerchief out, and he urinated in it. You know, human urine has ammonia in it, and he stuck that over his nose like this, and he managed to get out of there and survive the battle. I'm sure there were a lot of people peeing in handkerchiefs that day, uh, following his... <laughs> Pardon me, following his example, <coughs> and they managed to survive. But then, uh, of course, the gas mask, you get this down. Whoops, where did it go? Right here. <coughs> the gas mask becomes part and parcel. That's that, Those are actually Americans, but they, they have their gas mask, and their animals have the gas mask on, on too. Uh, gas was a horrible, horrible weapon. The nations of the world outlawed it. That's a painting by a British artist named John Singer Sargent. It's in the Imperial War Museum in London. And uh, there you see a group of young men blinded by gas. And the way they're making it back to the medical station, here's one man with sight kind of guiding them that you put your hand on the shoulder uh, of the other and you stumble back to get some sort of medical aid. That painting is called Gas, and it's one of the most famous coming out of, coming out of the first, first World War. There were also tanks, the very first tanks that were going to be used in World War I. Uh, let me go back here. Did I show you those? Did I show you these? Oops, did I show you these pictures yesterday of the trenches? Did I show you that? No. Well, that's a that's a British soldier. You can tell by his uniform. That's a trench in World War I. There are some people going over the top. You know, the whistle would blow and people would yell over the top. They'd scramble up the ladders and go attack. There are some British soldiers running through barbed wire on the way toward the German lines. Probably half or more of those people in that picture were killed in that assault. That's at the Battle of the Somme. We're going to talk about that. But again, I'm just showing you that the trench. They're dead Germans, probably killed by an artillery shell. You can see they probably were working on their trench. They've got a shovel over there, probably trying to reinforce their trench when the shell hit and killed them all. And another thing that shows is that it rained on the Western Front. It was a mud bog. People stood in mud for four years. And by the way, even though they put canvas in the boots trying to keep their feet dry, uh, they developed a, 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 an infection that's called trench foot. Your feet will slow up that big. And there's only one solution to that. 
they amputated them. And so uh, when the war is over in every major capital in Europe, you see young men, 18, 19, 21 years old, they're sitting around with a cup in front of them begging because their feet are gone. That's another casualty of war. There are World War trenches today. That, and there are tourists going up those. I just advise you when you go to those trenches, that's what's left of the trenches. I mean, if they're 100 years old, that's, they've, they've been pretty durable when you think about that. But, uh, you know, millions and millions and millions of shells and mines and all sorts of things were fired in World War I. So if you go tour those trenches, be very careful where you put your feet. I guess they're relatively safe. We've had 100 years to dig out all the mines and shells, but hardly a 10-year cycle goes by that somebody isn't over walking through Belgium or walking through France and they put their foot in the wrong place and it blows them sky high. It kills two or three uh, tourists. But there are still around what's left of the trenches of World War I. Of course, I showed you that, didn't I? That's the number one killer right there. There's the gas mask, okay. Uh, it's also an air war. We'll get this down. You know, uh, the Wright brothers had made the first flight in 1903. 11 years later, World War I starts. So it's uh, an air war. First air war in history, and these World War I pilots were some of the most heroic and romantic figures of the war. Uh, they were sort of viewed like the astronauts that we send to the moon today. Uh, they wore leather caps, and their wives or sweethearts or girlfriends would uh, knit them these long uh, scarves to wear around their neck, uh, and uh, they would fly off and they would engage in what was called dogfights. They didn't get much higher. They're, they're <laughs> you can see here they're double wingers. That's a British plane. <clears throat> but uh, they didn't get much higher than the uh, lights on the football field. In fact, the soldiers in the trenches had a ringside seat. They could watch both sides shoot it out. Uh, in fact, a lot of the pilots knew each other before. A lot of French pilots knew German pilots before the war, British pilots. And uh, they might send a message over saying, I'll be over, I'll be over no man's land tomorrow at 11 o'clock. I challenge you to a duel. And they would both, the planes would take off and they would appear over no man's land. They would shoot at each other with uh, with pistols. Okay, uh, that's a modern day plane modeled after a World War One plane. You see, that's advertising <laughs> Red Baron Pizza, uh, and a lot of people think that's a figment of someone's imagination. It's not. There's the Red Baron right there, writing down Baron von Richthofen. I guess he's the most famous pilot of the war. Baron von Richthofen. He shot down eighty planes. If you shot down 21 planes, you were considered to be an ace, and all these pilots want to be an ace, 21 planes. Well, he made that four times over. He shot down 80 planes, and he was called the Red Baron because when his squadron went into battle, he wanted everybody to know which plane was his, so he painted it red. So he's the Red Baron. And if you eat Red Baron pizza, if you have it, is it any good? If you look on the box I actually i haven't eaten it but i pulled one out of walmart just to look if you look on the box there's a world war one pilot on there he's got the leather helmet he's got the scarf it's baron von richthofen okay that's what that modern day brand of pizza is named after and, and by the way he was only <coughs> 22 22 or 23 years old and uh, in 1918 just to just to put a cap on him in 1918 just a few weeks before the war ended uh, he was in Belgium flying up the Somme River Valley, and he had shot down 80 planes, and he was going after number 81. I'm sure he knew that Germany had, quote, lost the war by that point, but I guess he wanted to shoot down as many planes before the war ended as he could. So he's going after this Belgian plane. There was an Australian soldier down in a trench. Australia had once been part of the British Empire, and Australians sent soldiers to fight for England. And this Australian was just sitting on the edge of the trench just looking up, and he sees this red plane, and everybody in the war knew this great pilot, Baron von Richthofen, and so he just aimed his rifle and shot him right through the heart uh, a few weeks before the war was over, and that was the end of Richthofen. America had an ace, the United States had an ace, right this guy down, there he is in his plane, there you see his machine guns, uh, Eddie Rickenbacker, okay, Eddie Rickenbacker, he shot down, I don't know how many planes, but he shot down at least 21, and he was the most famous uh, American pilot. By the way, when the war started, you know, uh, there's Eddie, Eddie Rickenbacker. When the war started, 
you know, the plane was brand new uh, in combat. The, the plane was brand new, so, uh, you know, they had to make a few adjustments. At first, you know, they put the machine guns right up here. I'll just use this model of a World War I plane. They put the machine gun right up there, uh, and they didn't synchronize the propeller. This is a prop job. So when that propeller's going around, you've got to synchronize it, because when you fire, you're going to be shooting through your propeller. And you have to synchronize the propeller and the machine gun. If you know what happens, here's an enemy plane, you're flying down on it, and you squeeze the trigger on your machine gun, what do you do? You shoot your propeller off and crash to the ground. Then after a few episodes of that, they went back to the drawing board and they synchronized the propellers and, you know, all was well, I guess. Uh, got this down. Here's another um, weapon of World War I, the very first tanks in, in the history of warfare. The very first tanks, and that's a World War I tank. There's a, there's a tank today, okay, that's a... That's a mobile arsenal, okay? But that's an American tank today. But here's the great great grandfather of that American tank. I said they didn't achieve a breakthrough. Get this down. The British actually, toward the end of the war, did a slight breakthrough because they had developed tanks. Did you ever wonder why a tank was called a tank? <clears throat> By the way, these things had machine guns. See right there? They had machine guns on both sides. And they could go across no man's land with people shooting at them, and nobody inside was harmed. And if they could get over the German trench, usually they fell in and got stuck. Uh, but uh, if they could get past the German trench, they could, you know, they could break through the barbed wire and they could achieve a breakthrough in the line. If you ever wonder why a tank is called a tank? Well, these things were built in factories in London. Here's my rough map of England and Scotland, roughly like this. This is Scotland, this is England. Here's London on the Thames River in the south of England. They built them down here in London, but they knew London was full of German spies, uh, and uh, they didn't want the Germans to know about these new weapons. But before they sent them into combat, they had to test them out. So they had to put them on trains, those things, and they had to take them all the way to Scotland. If you ever have a chance, go to the Scottish Highlands. It's one of the most beautiful places in the world. And if you ever feel like you want to get away from it all, go to the Scottish Highlands, because when you're standing out of the Scottish Highlands, you're about as isolated as you can get in this world. The only thing up there is beautiful scenery and rabbits that big. First time I went up there, I thought I was in a science fiction movie. There were just these rabbits, gigantic rabbits everywhere. But anyway, the Scottish Highlands. And because it's so isolated, they said, that's where we're going to test these tanks. But the problem was, how do you get it from London up to Scotland? So here's what they did. Get this down. This is why a tank is called a tank. They put them in big wooden, they built them and put them in big wooden crates. You know, th listen, you understand this is a horse war, right? Yes. This is the last great cavalry war, World War I. So there are tens and hundreds of thousands of mules and horses. And those mules and horses had to have water tanks. And the water tanks were big. Uh, and so to fool the Germans, they would crate these things up in big wooden crates and they would stack up with water tank, water tank. And there they were sitting on the train and the train would take off for Scotland and the spies, the German spies in the train depot would look and say, eh, it's no big deal, those are water tanks. And that name stuck, tanks. That's a little trivia for you, but that's why a tank is called a tank. And toward the end of the war, they're not introduced until the very end of the war, but until the end of the war, uh, or, or at the end of the war, uh, they managed to make a slight breakthrough that made absolutely no difference at this point. By World War II, World War II is a tank war. In fact, tanks replace the horse cavalry, okay? Tanks replace, by the way, can you go in the cavalry today if you join the military? Can you go sign up at a recruiting station and say, I want to join the, I want to jo join the cavalry? Yes, you can. They'll, they'll let you ride in and say, yeah, he, what, what are you talking about when you're talking about joining the cavalry today? What are you going to train as? A tank man. Or what's the other cap, branch of the cavalry today? Helicopters. Helicopters and tanks. That's the cavalry today. If you join that on your uniform right there on your lapel, you'll still have the cross swords just like the old horse cavalry. Horse cavalry. There's a little more trivia for you. 
Well, uh, the ferocity of this war took the world by surprise. The world had never seen a war like World War I. Let me just explain that to you. There was more ammunition fired at the Battle of the Argonne Forest. Write that down. When I mention these battles, uh, Argonne Forest, it's another famous battle. At the Battle of the Argonne Forest, there was more ammunition fired in three hours than it was fired in the entire Civil War. Just think about that. In three hours, they fired more ammunition than was fired in the entire American Civil War. The world had never seen a war like this. And there are two great battles I want to talk about right now. Get this down. And I want you to know about these battles. I think these are the two bloodiest battles of World War I. They are, number one, uh, July of 1960, they're both fought roughly at the same time, the summer of 1916, the Battle of the Somme, okay, the Battle of the Somme. The Somme is a river, you, you know, knowing who, what, when, and where, you can't understand history unless you know that. The Somme is a river in Belgium. The Somme is a river, river valley in Belgium. The second battle Everybody look out here. There's the Somme right there. The second battle fought at roughly the same time, although it goes on much longer, was the Battle of Verdun. Verdun was a medieval castle, an ancient castle. A medieval castle is 180 miles east of Paris. There's Paris. There's Verdun. Okay, uh, the battle at Verdun. So it too is fought in the summer of the 1916. At the Battle of the Somme, and I'm speaking in broad general terms right now, you have the British versus the Germans. And at the Battle of Verdun, you have the French versus the Germans. Okay, so we're going to do these. We're going to do these one at a time. So let's do the Battle of Verdun. Oh, excuse me, the Battle of, of the Somme. The, we'll go to Belgium first. You know where they're fought. The Somme is fought in Belgium. Verdun is fought where? Paris. Where? Paris. Well, east of Paris, it's fought in France. Yeah, it's fought 180 miles east of Paris. All right. So everybody got all this information up on the board here? Everybody got that? Yes? Okay. Well, so here's what happened at the Battle of the Somme. <clears throat> you have the British lines, and you have the German lines, and this out in the middle, of course, is no man's land. And here's what the British in July, July of 1916 decided to do. The British said, we're going to pick out a 12-mile section of the German lines, and we're going to concentrate all of our artillery fire on that 12-mile section of the line. Get this down. We're going to literally blow a hole through the German trenches. There will be no German soldiers left. There will not be a cricket alive out in that field. And when this part of the German line is destroyed, we are going to send 220,000 men across that field. Get this down. This is what happens at the Battle of the Somme. I don't want you to just know there was a thing called Somme. I want you to know what happened. We're going to send 220,000 men through that hole. Look up here at this map real quick. We're going to blow the hole in that line and we're going straight to Berlin. 220,000 men. You with me? 220,000 men and the war will be over. And so on July 16th, I believe it was, but that's not important. On July 16th, they started a six day, excuse me, that's not right. Uh, but anyway, in July, 1916, they started a six day for six days, 24 hours a day. In late June, they started this, just to be correct. Anyway, a six day bombardment, 
24 hours a day. And after six days of bombarding the German lines, 24 hours a day, on Saturday, July the 1st, 1916, 220,000 British soldiers stepped off into no man's land. And they're absolutely calm and they're absolutely confident and they're saying the war is over because nothing can be left over there. We're not going to get killed because nothing is left over there. The Germans and their trenches are blown to smithereens. Okay? <clears throat> In fact, the, Ger the, the, the British soldiers were laughing, many of them, as they come out of the trenches. This is the final battle of the war, they think. <clears throat> and there was something else I was going to tell you. My memory is getting so bad. There was something else I was going to tell you about this. But I've, uh, I've uh, forgotten that. Hmm. Well, anyway, maybe it'll come back to me. They had gone about the length of a football field. They had gone about 100 yards. And what happened was they bombarded this all right. But get this out. The trenches collapsed on top of the Germans. Okay, The Germans are in their trenches. The British start bombarding it. And the trenches collapse on top of it. In other words, they're packed down there in the timber and the dirt, holding on to their machine guns. And for six days, they're trapped down there in the mud and the dirt. But that doesn't kill them. You with me? All that dirt packed on them. And on the morning of July the 1st, when the shooting stopped, they know what's coming and attack. And guess what they do? They dig themselves out and they just set their machine guns up right on top of those collapsed trenches and they just wait for the British to come along. And they hear the British troops coming through the smoke. They can hear them singing and shouting cheers because this is the end of the war. And about 100 yards into this, about 100 yards into this, the Germans opened fire, and they slaughtered them. I gave you this statistic the other day. 85 British soldiers were hit by machine gun fire every one second. 85, 85, 85, 85, 85. There are 500 men gone in the time it took to snap my fingers. On that day, get this down, July the 1st is the worst day in the history of the British Army. And the British Army is a thousand years old. 22,000 were killed and 40,000 were wounded. And they were thrown back in their trenches. And what did they do the second day? Any idea? Huh? Bomb them again. Didn't bomb them again. What did they do the second day? What do you think they did? After losing 22,000 dead on the first day, what did they do the second day? Go back. They attacked. Get this down. They attacked again, and they lost thousands more. And from July to November, they attacked almost every day. July, August, September, October, November. And 420,000 British soldiers were killed and wounded in one battle. And if you count the French, <laughs> there were some French troops involved in this, and the Germans, at the Battle of the Somme, one battle, 1.4 million soldiers, 1.4 million soldiers were killed and wounded. And did the British achieve a breakthrough? Yes or no? No. 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 A million people dead and wounded, and the lines barely moved. That's why in Belgium today, as I was telling you the other day, I'm sure, farmers, when they park their tractors and they look at their discs where they've been plowing, they may see a jawbone stuck in that disc. They're still digging up the dead bones of soldiers from the Somme Valley, from the Battle of the Somme. Well, at the same time, get this down, the Germans launched, you know, at the same time this battle is going on up here in the Somme, the Germans said that would be a good time with the British and French army occupied up here to strike here. 
in eastern France. Uh, and they were going to attack right here and march 100, I think it's 180 miles, uh, break through the British uh, uh, and Fran break through the French lines, excuse me, and march all the way to Paris and capture it. And they have this fixation that if they capture Paris, they win the war. And so at the same time, get this down, that the Somme is going on, the uh, Germans attack Verdun. Now, of course, the French knew, now listen to what I'm saying, the French knew that if they broke through, excuse me, the, uh, the French knew that if the Germans, you're with me, if the Germans broke through at Verdun, if they broke through here, that the war was over, that they would march to Paris and the war would be over. In fact, the president of France came down just before the Battle of Verdun began, and he talked to the French general who was in charge of defending Verdun. And that general's name, get his name down, was uh, Philippe Faitan, okay? Philippe Faitan. And uh, the French president comes down and talks to him and just emphasizes and presses upon him uh, how important this is that the Germans be held back. Today, if you go to Verdun, there's a cemetery. It's got a million dead bodies in it, German and French. A million dead bodies in that cemetery in Verdun. And over the gates of the cemetery going into Verdun, you know, when the president of France came down to General Pétain and told him, if you fail, if the Germans break through, we lose the war. Pétain said this, write these words down, because this is what you see over the cemetery. <clears throat> Pétain said to the president of France, they shall not pass. They shall not pass. So if I ask you on the test, which were the following World War I battles, which most closely associated with the words, they shall not pass, what are you going to select? What? Verdun. Verdun. Okay. And so the battle started. Get this down. This is the longest battle in World War I. It lasted 300 days. 300 days and nights. The fighting never stopped. You know, think about going, most of us will never be in a battle, but think about going into going through a battle that lasted a day or two. How exhausting, how nerve-wracking that must be. These men fought for, the Germans attacked for 300 straight days and nights. Uh, in the opening bombardment, just think about this, when the Germans started bombing the French lines, the Germans rained 100,000 shells per hour for 12 hours on a six-mile sector of the French lines. All told at the Battle of Verdun, 40 million shells were fired. Uh, the trenches disintegrated, and of course the men lived in shell holes for six months. Not for a couple of days, for six months. They ran out of water. They drank their own urine because they had no water. Uh, they uh, ran out of food. Uh, they deprecated and urinated right there in the trench, and they lived in their own filth. I'm talking about 100 men in a shell hole. They lived in their own filth for 100 days, or 200 days, <laughs> excuse me, or 300 days. I think I have a picture. I get this to work. There we go. I think I have a, or I had a picture. Well, I don't, I guess I do. But I thought I had a picture of a shell hole. And to show you, and I don't, of course. Anyway, uh, for 300 days, uh, the French fought. But the Germans, get this down, the Germans did not break through. By the way, there's another new weapon. There's another new weapon introduced at uh, the Battle of Verdun. Introduced, and it becomes a standard in World War II, and it's the flank drill. This is the battle in which men are going to be cooked alive, literally burned to death with liquid fire. That's what a that's what a uh, flamethrower that's what a flamethrower is. And so again, uh, at this battle, another million men killed and wounded, and the lines lines didn't move. One other battle, and I'm not going to talk about it, but it's a very bloody battle in World War Two. World War One, excuse me. I want you to write this down: the Battle of uh, Passchendaele. Okay. And this was a battle uh, in which the, German, the British took on the Germans. And this is in Belgium as well. Belgium. 
When you talk about bloody battles, someday, those of you that go on to uh, increase your education, someone might mention Passchendaele, well, it's a World War I battle. It's not fought in the Boer War. <clears throat> and at Passchendaele, uh, another uh, 290,000 British boys died. Uh, and the only thing that they accomplished is they pushed their lines forward just about five miles. And right here is the bridge that a lot of the past, this is the Menin Gate in Belgium, the Menin Gate, and British troops on the way to Paschendau, most of them to get killed, marched through there. And in fact, if you go there up on the walls, they don't have all the names of all 300,000 British boys that died at that battle, but they have many names of British soldiers who died there. And since the uh, early 1920s, uh, every day at 5 o'clock, I think since 21 or 22, just a few years after the war, every day at 5 o'clock, a British sergeant, a sergeant of the British Army, this is in Belgium, this is not in England, okay, knowing where is so important. This is in Belgium, that, belt, that bridge I'm showing you. But a British uh, sergeant uh, walks out and stops the traffic. And traffic can go through there. There's a street, stops the traffic, and a British bugler comes out and he blows uh, the last post. What is the song that we have to honor our dead military heroes? If you go to Normandy and D Day, go be sure and go stay around the five o'clock when they uh, sound what? What song do they play for all those dead soldiers over there that were killed in 1944? Taps, have you heard Taps? Well, the British have a song, a bugle call, and it's called The Last Post. And every day they stop the traffic there, and they have since 1921 or 22, and they play The Last Post for those dead uh, uh, British boys from the Battle of Paschendal. Let me show you that ceremony real quick. I don't know what time it is, I don't care. If the bell rings, don't switch. Okay, that's that. Now that's the interior of that bridge. Can someone turn out the lights over there, please, so you can see this a little better? Thank you. That's Belgium. There comes the view.
That's where the Arizona sits. It's beneath that pond. I'm Joshua there. Hillen in front of the Lock the Guard Mine Crater on July 1st, 1916. A massive. Well, we don't care. Anyway. <laughs> but that monument you saw there is where the Arizona sits. It is sitting where it settled on the bottom of Pearl Harbor the day the Japanese sunk it, December 7, 1941. And there are actual the remains of the sailors on board that ship. Most of the men who died at Pearl Harbor died on board that one ship, and they're still there. So, anyway. What's a good temperature? Uh -huh. 71. Who's that 71? It's cold. No, that's what I'm asking. Three screens. I go to 10. Before I leave to go to golf, but that would be during eight hours. Yeah, well, what about that? Your golf is eight hours. I'm going to get it. Yes, my golf is during eight hours. Well, I understand. That's permissible. Come eight hours. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm explaining to them the black hole of Calcutta, and I need a tax here. <laughs> Can you turn that to one of those uh, light switches on a Sue Bride in here? Right there? Uh, yeah. uh, that's what I'm going to do. You got it right the first time. There yeah, there we go. In the screen, we have a little bit Right. All right, we will start this exam. Those, oh, yeah, please turn that off. Thank you. <laughs> 